Sermon, take five. No, this is take four. Sermon, take four. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Jesus came to his hometown, and his disciples followed them. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that's been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joses and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us as well? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their own hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went out among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts. To wear sandals, but not to bring a change of clothes. He said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake the dust that is on your feet off as a warning against them. And so they went out, and they proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we read this story from Mark's gospel today, I wonder, does it make you uncomfortable? Mark flat out says that Jesus could do no deed of power there in Nazareth because of the unbelief of the people. How does that square with your image of Jesus? Does that change how you think about him? If it does make you uncomfortable, I think that that's okay. It sure made Matthew uncomfortable. Matthew read Mark's gospel before writing his own and used Mark's as kind of a template. And when Matthew tells this same story, he changes it ever so slightly to say that Jesus did not do many deeds of power in Nazareth. But he leaves it open as to whether or not Jesus was able Whenever scripture makes us uncomfortable, I find it interesting to ask why. Why does Jesus' inability to do deeds of power in his hometown make us uncomfortable? Is it because as God's son, this story challenges our idea of God's almightiness? Is it because the unbelief of the people seems so potent? Maybe this story makes you worry about your own unbelief or question God's ability to work in your own life. What I find fascinating about this text is that it so often compels us to do just what Matthew did, to defend Jesus. We so dislike the idea of Jesus' inability to act that we start to explain it away or try to deny it somehow. It kind of reminds me of the scene in C.S. Lewis, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, when Lucy and Susan approach the lifeless Aslan bound upon the stone table. In their grief, they pity poor, helpless Aslan, and even in death, they try to remove his restraints to give him some dignity back. But they can't, just as they cannot do the thing they wish most, which is to bring him back to life. And they walk away despondent. We don't like to think of God as weak, as ineffectual, as helpless. Our God is an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing God, right? God can do anything God wants. But if that's the case, why is Jesus so helpless in Nazareth? As we approach the story, we may try to remove his bonds like the girls trying to unbind the lion to rationalize and theologize, but the truth is still left lying on the table, staring us in the face. Jesus could do no deed of power there. 
In that moment, at that place and time, Jesus is weak. Mark's story confronts us with this weakness of Jesus. But he doesn't present that weakness as a failure. I learned something this week that I found very interesting. First of all, the word hometown in Greek can mean anything from hometown to homeland. In other words, it might not refer just to Nazareth, but to the whole area around it. Second, Jesus' neighbors call him a carpenter. The Greek word means a craftsman or a builder. It's a step above an unskilled day laborer, but still a very low-status job. And I learned this week that these carpenters, these builders, were itinerant, which means that they lived in one place with their family, but they spent most of their time away from home looking for work. That means that throughout the rest of the countryside around Nazareth, and all those surrounding villages of Jesus' homeland, all those people would have known Jesus just as well, at least by reputation, as the people in Nazareth. They would have had the same reaction as the Nazareans. Jesus would have been amazed at their unbelief, and he would not have been able to do any deeds of power in those villages either. Now, according to Mark, when Jesus realizes that he can't do anything more himself, he turns to the disciples. Now, let me just remind you at this point that these are the same disciples that scarcely a chapter ago were being berated by Jesus for their own lack of faith in the boat after the storm. Remember that? At this point in Mark's story, these guys still don't know who Jesus really is. And as we're about to see, even when they do know, they still don't get what that means. In spite of this, these are the people to whom Jesus gives the same authority he has to cast out unclean spirits and to proclaim the same message that he proclaims, to repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And you know what? They do it. They're successful. As unskilled and unprepared and unworthy as these disciples are, they are able to do the deeds of power that Jesus cannot. Jesus' weakness in this story functions less like a shortcoming and more like an asset. As his disciples, and by extension we readers, begin to understand that this story isn't actually about Jesus. It's about what God is doing. And that involves us as well. So if this story is about you, where does it apply to what's happening in your life? Where are you feeling weak and overwhelmed, unable to do what you've been called to do? Or who do you have around you helping you to do the work that you can't do on your own? As I think about the answer to this question for myself, the first thing that comes to mind is our upcoming shift to hybrid worship. Now, many of us in this congregation remember the frustration of that shift to online worship over a year ago with its long-running hardware problems and technical glitches. I have to confess to you that I'm worried about those problems returning. A lot of people think I'm some sort of technical wizard, but I'm not. The truth is, I know enough to get myself into trouble, but not enough to always get myself out when it comes to computers. I'm worried that the problems that will arise because I don't feel equipped to solve them, and that those of you who choose to continue worshiping online will be be left feeling disconnected and frustrated all over again, and that I won't be able to do anything about it. I feel a bit like Jesus and Nazareth, unable to live up to everyone's expectations. But this story reminds me that worship, even hybrid worship, even all the computer stuff, that's not my thing. It's our thing, right? I'm not called to do this alone. Even Jesus needed help. In fact, we might say needing help wasn't a bug, it was a feature. It shows us that even though Jesus is the central player in Mark's gospel story, he's not the only one, and he's not meant to be. 
The kingdom of God is not something created by or for the most pious or most impressive or most saintly people. It's something that we experience most fully in relationship and in cooperation and in participation. And that's exactly how God wants it. And that's why God has called us together and why we have found ways to stay together even when we couldn't gather physically. We are a team. And no matter how unskilled or unprepared or unworthy any of us might feel, each of us is called to contribute to God's kingdom. That's why Paul says that if he's going to boast, he's going to boast in his weakness. Because his weakness, just like our weakness, shows God's weakness. And as Paul reminds us elsewhere, God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. And God's weakness is stronger than human strength. In God's foolishness, our weaknesses are not things to be avoided or hidden or ashamed of. Instead, they can even be resources for the benefit of God's work. As disciples of Christ, we can claim and even boast about our shortcomings because we know that those shortcomings are opportunities for the goodness of God to be made manifest. In my story, my own inability to make hybrid worship happen on my own is a reminder to me and to all of us that worship is not something we consume for enjoyment, but a work in which we all participate, in which we all do our best, all for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. I, for one, am grateful for a reminder that this isn't the Seth show, because Frankly, who would want to watch that? Instead, this is the means by which we all, physically and digitally, remain connected to one another and to the story of Jesus. So that's my story. But I'm curious. What's yours? Where have your shortcomings made space for new and greater things to blossom? How has God used your weakness to bless you or others? What people has God called into your life to walk alongside you in working for something bigger than yourselves? If we truly believe that we've been created in God's image, that includes even our weaknesses and our shortcomings. In Lewis's story, Aslan may have died in defeat, but only because he was able to entrust himself to a deeper older magic. Even Jesus, enduring the taunts and the jeers of the crowd to come down from the cross and save himself, testifies to the source of all our help. The various thorns that we carry in our flesh show us how God intends for us to need one another, to need God. We are at our best when we are together. Whether that together is physical, or digital, or even spiritual, as when we are gathered together around the table with the communion of saints across space and time. The place where I fall short is the place where you can pick me up. I can't help but see the goodness of God in that. <laughs>